So I do wonder, and I don't know this for a fact, but I do wonder, are there plenty of leaders out there who just say, yes, I understand and don't necessarily have that really solid understanding. So I think it's our job as people who present data to help them understand and to make data as digestible and valuable and usable as possible without making them feel like they don't understand and without having that conflict between do I say I don't understand or do I just sit here, say yes, and really not have this data be valuable to me. Hey there and welcome to yet another episode of the World of Presentations podcast brought to you by uh, us at Presentation Agency 356 Labs. It's still 7 a.m. here, so I'm a little bit... I don't know where I am exactly, but still, our company is that agency you probably have heard already. We work with some of the biggest brands. We organize a conference that's called Present to Succeed, which turned out to be uh, the, the largest presentation skills conference in the world. And Boris, the founder of that company, is still a little bit sleepy for this episode, but I will wake up after a second. And yet uh, today I have... Uh, incredible guest from our industry with me and someone who is a fellow podcast host. So she is someone who helps people tell stories with their data. That's simple, you know? I like those type of descriptions, by the way. She is also, as I mentioned, the co-host of a very, very popular presentation podcast called The Presentation Boss Podcast. Uh, that is more or less uh, meaning for everyone that's listening that you need to check it out. Uh, and lastly, uh, she is also a trainer and delivers workshops on various topics related to PowerPoint, visual communication, and more, important, more importantly, data visualization and data storytelling. So, who is she? Her name is Kate Norris. And today, as you, I think, guessed already, we are going to be talking about data uh, visualization. <laughs> so, Kate, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's lovely to be here. Sorry for being sleepy in those first 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was a little bit unusual for even for me. That's the beauty so of being on the other start side of the with, world. Yeah, let's start with 2 p.m. on your time zone as we talked just a few minutes ago, 7 a.m. here. Let's talk, uh, let's start with that type of question that we ask absolutely everybody um, and everyone, every single person that goes on this podcast. We are very close to 100 episodes now, very, very close. Um, every single person has a strange story of how they got into the presentation space. What happened on your end? Yeah, it is, an, it is always interesting, isn't it? Because it's never a direct route. It's not something you go and study and then, you know, that's, that's what you want to do from a little girl. Um, so I guess for me, I have a background in data analysis. So... Um, I spent about 10 years doing finance and also workplace health and safety. So I was in finance for a number of years and uh, giving lots of presentations about budgets and forecasts and surprise, no one wanted to listen to them. Um, you know, just a lot of data happening there. Yeah. And then I moved into workplace health and safety. And if you think no one wants to listen to finance, they want to listen to safety even less. <laughs> And yeah. I have this like pathological need to be liked. So I set myself this goal that people were actually going to be interested in my presentations for safety. And I basically started from being this very shy, very, um, I mean, I'm an extrovert, but I'm, I was still very shy. And I started from basically these awful data heavy presentations and went, how am I going to make people listen to them? And it took me years to very, very slowly claw my way into, you know, being somewhat interesting um, to people who were not interested in the data and the stats and everything. And then um, I had my daughter, my first child, and basically full-time work and dropping her at daycare um, super early were just not working for me. Um, so I decided to start my own business, looked at my skill set, which was data presentations and I met um, yeah. Thomas who I think you've had on the podcast I know you haven't had on the podcast yep. um, and we worked there that there was kind of a gap in the market for this kind of visual communication presentation skills 
and um, yeah, we knew that we had something to offer. So that's, yeah, that's where Presentation Boss kind of started and came from. So we've been going for a couple of years now and basically teaching people what took me absolutely years to learn. Yeah, but it's a learnable skill. Oh, absolutely. You know? Many people say, oh, yeah, many people are like, oh, they're born, they're born with it, you know? It's not. I, by the way, started more or less the same. Like my first experiences with public speaking were terrifying. No, I was not able to, to, like, I was not. Able, I was constantly watching, uh, watching at the ceiling or at the floor, so there was no eye contact. And it took me a month of rehearsals throughout a presentation course that I enrolled in, with the only focus of just changing the way I was doing those presentations, changing, only thinking about eye contact, nothing else for a month, just that. But at the end it worked, you know, so finally I managed to figure it out. So it's a learnable skill. And that's something that I think our audience who are people from the business world need to hear because at the end of the day, like everyone is like, okay, they, they were born, like everyone looks at Steve Jobs or whoever. And he's like, they were born with it. No, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately for you guys, no, you can learn it. So do the work and learn that skill. It will be of use. All right, let's talk about data. There is in the, you also, the presentation boss podcast is also tailored and aimed at business people. This podcast is also tailored to that same audience, not just, uh, of course, there are people from the presentation world that are listening, but still. Uh, what we want to bring in, in the same way as with the conference, it is the business people, as we like to say, the people who are being asked to present, whether they like it or not, you know, so they need to be presenting data or I would say data became part of what they need to be presenting. Let's just put it this way. However, they're constantly pushing themselves to visualize that data. And probably my first question would be here. Is it, is it that every single time they should chase to put a chart in their on their slides like is that always mandatory when you're presenting data do they need to always think of hey we definitely need a chart now let's see what exactly is that chart or graph is that the way they need to approach it yeah interesting i think um if we kind of look straight at the chart i would call that step 3 and, yeah. you know, if you call step one, the analysis, the exploring of the data, um, and then step two is going to be then, what are you trying to say? Who are you trying to communicate it to? And then step three, like that will drive step three of whether you need a chart or not. Cause sometimes, yes, absolutely. You will need a chart. Um, sometimes it might be a table. Sometimes it might be even just, you know, one big number. If you've got you know, let's, let's call it 40%. If you're presenting your 40% of something, um, sometimes a chart isn't necessarily appropriate for that. You might just want a big four zero up on your slide. Yeah. Um, so, so it's not, not yeah. pardon? it's not like every single time the chart is the destination. Yeah. Yeah, it should be part it, of the process. Yeah, not the destination. I like that. I like that. So, by the way, you, you are saying three steps. How many steps? Like, what are the... You obviously have some steps that you follow <laughs> when you're visualizing data. There was a little bit more here, like very quickly. Um, so, I see that there's... In terms of the presentation, like the data presentation side, I say there's four steps. The first one is exploring your data. So, that's your data analysis. And we don't teach that mm. because that is a completely like whole skill set in itself, data analysis. And the data presentation has to come after that. And I think that there's um, three steps to data presentation that, it, that is plan, design, deliver. You plan, which is working out your audience and also your message. Your design is then your data visualization and your PowerPoint. And then your deliver is all your presentation skills, you know, your body language, your eye contact, um, how you use the stage, your voice, all of that kind of physical delivery stuff. Mm. So data presentation Good. covers all three of them. 
Um, but what we talk about often as presentation skills is to me only one step of that. Yeah. And that I think that most of the times what people are referring to when they talk about presentation skills is that last step, you know, the delivery part, the body language part, the way it's being set when you're on stage or when you're on a virtual call nowadays, obviously, etc. And still those planning stages and the planning stage and the design stage are just also very, very important. Let's put them this way. Oh. Like it's super, super important. Yeah. Probably as important as you would say as the delivery because they I think in what we see with our customers is that if just one of those three things fails, you have a problem. Right? You may have the most beautiful visual. If you cannot deliver it well, you have a problem. Right? You have you can have the most beautiful visual, but it was if it's not for the proper audience, for the right audience, well that won't work either, you know, like it's so, yeah, it's a problem. It it is a mixture, it's a mix of things and all those three things need to play in absolute sync. Yeah, um, because we see sometimes that people just think that they need better body contact, uh, body contact, <laughs> um, body language or eye contact. <laughs> you know, yeah. they just need to work on their voice. And it's like that's not where confidence comes from. Confidence comes from knowing what you're going to say, knowing that you're communicating something. And we see confidence just, you know, skyrocket once people are very comfortable in what they have to say. That's where it mostly sits yeah, is in that plan so. stage. Yeah. So what about, like you said that some, sometimes you need a table, right? Sometimes you, somebody will need, okay, just a simple number. Uh, how do you, because you said the planning and the audience are important. What are like, if we just go very quickly in the topic of planning for a data visualization or for that data representation or data presentation, as you said, what are the top things that they need to plan for, you know, except for the audience? Is there something else that you would say is super important before they start building any charts, any graphs, any tables or whatever the, the visual uh, would be? Like anything else there? I think maybe making sure that you've got a very clear storyline and a through line that's going to connect your entire presentation start to finish. So making sure that you've, uh, if we look at um, the Nancy Duarte model of data story is a three-step or three-phase story. Um, I really like that model. I think it's very effective, uh, which is context, conflict, and conclusion. Making sure that you've got that through line before you then use your charts to back up what you're saying. And I think the problem that we see sometimes is people go straight to charts and they just start putting charts onto PowerPoint and then they're trying to find a message that fits those charts. And that's kind of backwards. It's the backwards way of doing it because then your flow and your story isn't congruent. It doesn't flow and make sense. You've got to have that bit making sense first with your visuals to back that up. Yeah, absolutely. I will say, uh, yeah. And by the way, for everyone who hasn't uh, seen that and read that book by Nancy Duarte, uh, what was the name of the book? The data. It's it called data, data story. Data yeah. Story? Fantastic book. Data story, yeah. Yeah. Definitely one of the best books on data for sure. Easily. Uh, I was about to say, because I was not remembering the name, I was about to say it's blue. You know, you'll find yes. it. Just type in the author's name. It is blue. You'll find it. All right, going back to the going back to the charts. Uh, what are the what are the most common charts that people should be aiming for? Like a lot of the people that are here and listening, watching, whatever they present in front of other business people, be that uh, executives, be that their let's say the next level, the management in the hierarchy, uh, be that I don't know designers, be that HRs, marketing people, etc. We know together with you that there are a lot of visualizations that are on the market. Some of them are quite expected, you would say. Some of them are quite popular. Some of them are quite extreme and unusual even. What are the charts? What are the visualizations that the business world expects? You know, like what are they familiar with so that people can know what are they chasing here and what should they be trying to, uh, trying to build? I think sticking with your very simple charts for explanatory purposes, for data presentation purposes. So the charts that 
everybody understands are like bar charts, column charts, and line charts. They're simple and they almost feel simplistic, which is also where the beauty of them is. Um, and I'll put pie charts in there. I don't love recommending pie charts. Um, and in the data viz world, pie charts are a bit of a contentious um, topic. Yeah. But I think a lot of analysts, they're so into charts and they're so intelligent and they're trained in all sorts of data visualizations. And the assumption is that everybody understands these charts and not everybody does. It doesn't matter if they're an executive. And I hear this all the time is they're an executive, so they should understand. But mm. those complex visualizations are really for analysts to analyze data because you're looking for patterns and you're looking for different things within those more complex visuals. But to explain, even like a waterfall chart is quite nice. I mean, that's basically a bar chart anyway, but just stick to those very simple ones. Um, I think, you know, if a seventh grader, you know, you're looking at about 12 years old, if they can understand it, that's a great graph to use. If you've learned it by the time you've finished primary school, absolutely go with it. All right. That, that's interesting, by the way. I don't remember when we were at school, at least for someone to show us charts or anything. But that's probably me. I don't know. And I would say that education, educational level and the quality of education probably will vary <laughs> depending on the country. Oh, that's true. That's that, true. <laughs> <laughs> that, that will be very interesting to see what people think about that. Like up until, I would say that people, even up until my graduation, when I was 18, I was still not aware and familiar with those types. Yeah, okay, fair enough. That's strange. Um, that's, that's, now that I think about it, it's strange. You know, because nowadays, I don't know what's your take on it, but nowadays, the, the students that are like the children, okay, or the youngsters that are still in school, this, this generation is completely different anymore. Oh, yeah. You know, they for sure have seen charts and graphs in one way or the other just because of social media. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, like, it's crazy like, what they learn. Um, yeah, we, yeah. My daughter is seven now and she brings home things that she learns. And I think, oh, I'm going to use that in my business because that's advanced stuff. Like she's seven and she's learning this stuff. Um, there was one. Do you guys have Oreos? You know, like the biscuit Oreos? Yeah, the biscuits. Yeah, so the she's biscuits. got this Oreo structure, yeah. which is like opinion, reason, example, opinion. And they call it Oreo and all the kids, you know, get Oreos and they get taught to give an opinion using this very simple structure. And I think, man, I learned that at university. And she's seven and she's learning it. Just the, the difference in education is just um, stark in each generation, I think. Yeah. 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 For sure, like for sure, you can easily see that, like easily, easily see that. And the fact that they they were born with the internet in their hands, it's just, they don't know the world before touch screen displays and stuff like that. It's just mesmerizing to me. Like, yeah, it's crazy. Like, just for some of you who are listening, just think about it. They don't. There are people out there. Just think about that. In a like, spend five minutes thinking. About, there are people in the world that don't know the world before internet and before iPhone. How crazy is that? You know, yeah. like every single time I, the last time when I saw this was with a small boy that was, um, a friend, like he was a family friend of some kind. And so my father has one of those old Nokia phones, uh, which has buttons. Yeah. On yeah. It. And this old, this, this small boy took the phone of my father and started swiping across the numbers and he was like why is this not working and i was looking at him trying to understand what is going on and then 30 seconds later i was like this is the first time probably he's seeing a phone like that that's that is that is so that is the crazy part anyway going back to the data visualization, <laughs> the data, the data visualization space Okay, so we, you said, okay, probably the simple number is a simple number and that will be very easy to understand. Yeah. Uh, then we have the tables. Tables are, I would say, familiar to everybody. 
every single time. What is your opinion on tables for presentations, by the way, when you have to present them live? I think as long as there is a purpose. For example, I would use a table if you're looking at ranking something and the number doesn't necessarily matter. So often to rank something, a bar chart's really great. Um, but if the number doesn't really matter, then a, a table would work perfectly fine. If you know you want the top five or the top 10 of something, a table's great because then you can kind of see it in list form. Got it. So we have the simple number, we have the table, then we have the, as you said, the bar charts, the column charts, the pie charts, depending on like who you are asking, I would say there are a lot of discussions obviously <laughs> on that topic. What is the latest? I, I stopped following that research and everything else around it. What is the follow? What is the latest news around whether or not pie charts are evil or not? What have you seen? Pie charts and are back in. your take on it? All right, they're back. Yeah, pie Morgan. charts are back, <laughs> but with very uh, with caveats around them, I guess. So you've got to have a very good no, reason no. for using a pie chart. Um, All right. And the reason is a very visual reason. If you just want to see if an amount is bigger or smaller, um, what we don't want to see in pie charts and where they got their really bad name is if you've got like 30 categories and you've got 30 tiny yeah. little pieces and then you've got text everywhere and these like data labels going everywhere. You don't want a million pieces of pie. You want one or two. And the other thing that they're really good for is if you want to see what is two categories together making up. Yeah. But again, two or three categories in a pie chart kind of maximum. Um, it's got to be very visual and not messy. Yeah. That's by the way, if you think the pie, pie chart has got the bad name for it, but if you, if we have to be completely honest, if you put 30 lines on the line chart, it will be the same, you know, like, come on. That's so true. It is. Yeah. It is actually really true. Like just imagine it in the same way as with 30, 30 or okay. Bar bars and columns, you may figure it out, you know, depending on where you're projecting that. Uh, and where you're presenting it, like what's the surrounding of that type of thing. But I cannot imagine a line chart with 30 colored, colored mm -hmm. lines in one way or the other, because the pie charts and the, the pies in uh, the pies in a pie chart are always colored, you know, by default. So yeah, I can imagine 30 will get brutal and <laughs> painful very easily. Yeah, and I've but seen plenty of them the too, <laughs> those kinds of charts. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So yeah, you said something very interesting that if there are executives that they need to know, right, in regards to charts, what are the, is that the, is that really the case? What do, what are you seeing with the executives that you are working with? I think... Do they need to know? There's a bit of an assumption that because they're an executive, they will automatically understand data slash graphs, mm. charts. And that's not necessarily the case because I don't think that that is mm. an essential skill to have data analysis. That's why you've got data analysts who work for you. That's why, you know, we get employed as data analysts. Um, and I, I saw a LinkedIn post recently and it was from uh, like a chief data scientist or something. Uh, I can't remember. It was from an executive at Google. And she basically said the other day she had an employee come up to her and try to give her, or it was a presentation, a heap of information and a heap of graphs. And she said to them, I don't understand what you're telling me. You need to you know, simplify this. And she said, earlier on in my career, I don't know if I would have had the confidence to actually say, I don't understand because I was always expected as a manager, as an executive to understand. And I didn't have that confidence to mm. say, I don't understand. And I do, it does make me wonder, are there managers, senior leaders, executives who are trying to get to that next level that are not confident enough to say, I don't understand because there may be that perception that they will lose that credibility if they say, I don't understand. So I do wonder and I don't know this for a fact, but I do wonder, are there plenty of leaders out there who just say, yes, I understand and don't necessarily have that really solid understanding? So I think it's our job as people who present data 
to help them understand and to make data as digestible and valuable and usable as possible without making them feel like they don't understand and without having that conflict between do I say I don't understand or do I just sit here, say yes, and really not have this data be valuable to me. Mm. And by the way, when you're saying that, let's switch very quickly to, okay, we know we know what are the charts that they would understand because they're just, they just became like the default in, and they're so popular, like the bars, the column, the pies, the donuts, I would say are very close, you know, to the pies, to the pie charts. Uh, but have you seen any other type of chart or graph that may end up being useful, you know, for the business world and which one would that be? Because there are some, I would say, kind of ex- like a little bit more unusual visualizations that still have their place under the sky. Yeah, it really comes down to how well you use the chart. If you look at, mm. say, for example, Hans Rosling, um, who I believe is the greatest presenter of data ever, he uses bubble charts and they're moving bubble charts. Now in themselves, they can be very, very complex charts, but the way that he explains them and uses them makes them very digestible. So I think almost any chart can be used as long as it is explained very simply and explained piece by piece and not just kind of put up there and your audience expected to um, basically do the analyzing themselves. You've got to be able to explain what you are seeing in that graph and explain how you came to that conclusion and not just kind of leave them with this overload of information that they're trying to comprehend and then apply and, you know, all that stuff that, you know, you as the analyst should be doing. Yeah, that one, I think it's a great advice, by the way, for everyone who is going to be building charts that are outside of the bars, the t- the typical ones, let's put them this way, like push yourself and understand that sometimes you need to explain how this chart works in very simple yeah. terms before you actually present it, you know, like maybe there would be with the same data, explain it very, like not very, but slowly and carefully in simple words, how, what are people seeing, right? Or the other way around it, I always say to our customers, hey, if you're going to be using something that's a little bit more unusual, create before that slide with that chart, create another slide, you know, with a simplified version of that chart, you know, and explain that first and then move on to the real chart with the real data so that now the people in the audience have context, you know, they are trained in the, ne- in the last 10 minutes or in the last five minutes, how they need to approach it. And again, with your help, bring like go with them through that. Because if you're seeing, you don't want, and, and I would completely agree with what you're saying. Like I, now you made me think about that stuff about se- senior executives that probably don't want to say that on the, they, that they don't understand because they are worried about losing credibility. I think that that there is something to that one for sure. I haven't seen it. Like I haven't experienced it. If I have to think about and go back in time, I don't know if I can remind myself a moment like that, but I think there is something to that. And everyone should be very careful here. Like every presenter who is listening here should be very careful with stuff like that and have it in mind that by the way, I, would, I think that all of us would agree that doesn't mean that this executive is not on a top level, you know, like yeah. that. That's a completely different story. You know, it's very, very different. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting stuff. I think... Uh, um, all right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was to say, something like Tableau has mm. some beautiful functionality where you can see the change over time of something. And if you're explaining it to them, directing them where to look, you know, even if that takes a point of a finger or... Uh, laser or however you want to point to show them exactly where they need to be looking Mm. rather than giving them the whole graph and expecting them to see what you can see. If you can pinpoint like, this is what we're looking at. This is what you need to be understanding from this graph. Um, Yeah. Just, I think would go a long way in helping that understanding. Just kind of adding to what I said before. 
Yeah, completely. Top issues. What do you see people being a, having a little bit of difficulties or a little bit of they could do better when they're visualizing uh, data? What are the top three, let's say? I don't know. Oh, like I think this is going to be basically a culmination of everything that I've already said. But um, what I see happening frequently is people who get graphs and they just start putting graphs onto PowerPoint and then they start to see their trends and they start to see their story from that. And this kind of exploratory, this analysis side happens on PowerPoint. And then they're kind of wondering why this takes, you know, 18 revisions to actually get some sort of sign off on their final um, presentation or report or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they'd spent that time just outlining a story first, um, the amount of revisions severely or significantly decreases and it just becomes a lot simpler and much clearer story. So I think the biggest issue there is just dumping charts and graphs onto your PowerPoint first as like a first stop. It just creates a lot of frustration and confusion. And yeah, yeah, yeah. the revision process to this is, is just crazy, especially if there's multiple levels that need to get, need to sign off. Um, yeah, the revisions are just crazy. All right. So that's, that's the biggest one that you're seeing in with the people that are, wow, that's interesting. Like you're obviously working with a lot of people that need to sign off on presentations like that. That would be interesting. Yeah, that's probably more a reporting issue because I see data presentation as reporting or like a mm. verbal presentation. Um, if we're talking about a presentation, I think the biggest issue that I see there is probably about putting an entire slide straight up on a screen um, as opposed to drip feeding. So you kind of bring in one element at a time. There's a couple of ways you can do that in PowerPoint, either slide stacking. So each new slide brings in another element or you can just animate it you know, with all within one slide. Um, yeah, there's multiple ways that you can do that, but just bringing in one little piece at a time because then you're able to kind of control where your audience is looking. You not kind of letting them run off and create their own conclusions from the graph that you've got up there um, before you've had a chance to explain it. And it's kind of like what you said just earlier about like you've got one slide and you kind of explain that before you bring in the more complex stuff. Yeah. So data animation is like bringing in animation into charts is something that we should advise people to definitely check and test out because I think that I don't know whether or not you are also seeing the same, but I would say that a lot of people that we work with at least don't have an idea and were not familiar with the fact that you can animate a chart inside of PowerPoint. You know, it, of course, when it's not a picture, you know, like yeah. if it's a picture, if it's a picture, you cannot animate it. That's clear. But if it's not a picture, if it was just copy pasted from Excel or created natively, not that you cannot copy paste uh, from Excel into PowerPoint as a picture, but uh, you get my point here. Um, or, or if you created that chart from a, from inside of PowerPoint, you can animate that chart by just going to the animation tab, you know, and just yeah. using like animations like what wipe. I would say wipe would be for bar charts. Like you go from up to, uh, down from the bottom part to the up, uh, left to right. You can control the um, the direction. I'd say. Yeah. I would say. Yeah, so have you tried and experimented animating charts with Morph, by the way, with the new transition? Yeah, um, I like Morph. It's a beautiful, kind of simple transition. Yeah. So what do you think? Yeah, uh, I'm a personal fan of just the simple fade. <laughs> it's not exciting, but I just think it's just neat. And yeah, I'm a big fan of simplicity, really. <laughs> All right, think, so yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think I don't totally agree that you can't animate using a picture. It's a little bit messier, but you can do it. Like if you've only got a picture available, you simply use other elements to hide on top and have them reveal, have them actually yeah. disappear rather than things adding in. Uh, you just got to kind of backdoor it a little bit and have 
a black box or a white box, whatever color your background is, and have that reveal slowly come off one piece at a time if you yeah. only have a picture available and you want to do some animations. I think it's possible. You just got to yeah. kind of think outside of the box a little bit. Yeah, work around. A little bit of a work around. That's the same I yeah. think would with table animations and stuff like that where it, it is possible it's just what do you need to make it happen because there is a, like a lot of people in our industry know that table animation is possible from inside of powerpoint but when you show that to a business person everyone is like who would ever do that you know like why yeah. is microsoft thinking that that's normal and expected and that's easy to do you know like it's very strange Tables in PowerPoint are just the devil. They are just the worst. <laughs> yeah, that is true. I agree. I think, by the way, for everyone who doesn't know how to animate a table in PowerPoint, let us know in the comments. Wherever you see that podcast, let us know in the comments and we may be that good to tell you. We'll see. So, so um, any, any other mistake, any other place where you think people can optimize their time, uh, what they're bringing up to the table in regards to the visualization, any tips and tricks, you know, from inside of PowerPoint, from outside of PowerPoint, like outside of PowerPoint, anything that can help them navigate that data visualization moment in their presentations better. Like what you're, you are delivering a lot of trainings, a lot of workshops. There was one or two of the tricks that you are teaching your people, your students there. Oh gosh, I think maybe um, just really reducing that cognitive overload, making sure that you've only got your essentials in any of your charts. If you can get rid of mm. any, um, what are they called? Grid lines? Grids, yeah, grid lines. Yeah, oh gosh, there's a name for it and I should absolutely know the name. You know, all the lines. Um, even your axes, if you don't need that to be, on there, if you've got, you know, data labels as well as axes, it kind of becomes a bit redundant. So just kind of getting down to as little information being given to someone as possible, just really stick with the important parts, making sure that you're honing in on what is the most important thing here. Right. What about, what about, by the way, one last here, what about the titles? Do you teach them also something about the titles and how do you, how do they need to write a, a title of a chart? Because most of the charts are coming with a title that says uh q3 financials you know like um, yeah. marketing uh, marketing spent by month you know like stuff like that do you teach and do you teach them anything in that area because i know that the data visualization space uh, and obviously the presentation space is coping uh, meaning copying some taking some ideas from that space and just applying them in the presentation context where exactly as you said it's reporting not analyzing that much you know, like you want to report on the data and not make the audience analyze that data yeah. during a presentation. And obviously that's super time consuming. Anything around the titles? Yeah, I definitely um, suggest to people to have action driven titles. So like you said, instead of Q3 financials, you want to kind of get your message in there. So if it's like mm. Q3 had a 20% increase from Q3 last year or whatever, whatever your message is, um, giving that giving a little bit more information whether that's your key message your key takeaway or you know what action you want your audience to take um which could be q3 financials up 20 percent, therefore recommend xyz yeah i think yeah. That, that, by the way, that's one if you think about the titles and changing the titles from just marketing spend by whatever to something that's actionable and to the insight from the chart, that's probably one of the easiest fixes for yeah. a chart ever. You know, just change the word in the text box. That's it. You know, that's probably the easiest thing ever. And still, there are a lot of people that know about this and they're still wing it. You know, like they just copy paste the charts and they say, I'm ready. You know, so. Just that one simple change makes such a difference. You will be everybody that's listening, everyone. That that is huge. Like test it out and see what's going to happen. We promise you here with Kate, it will work. Okay. We promise you it will work. It does. So, it really does because it, it helps your yeah. audience know what they're looking for in that graph. Because yeah, if we use that same example, they're no longer looking at like Q3 financials. Oh wow, what am I seeing here? 
if they're reading Q3 financials up 20%, they can look at the graph and go, all right, this is up 20% and it immediately kind of reduces the time it takes them to read that graph and understand what's going on. Yeah, it's hugely powerful. You're right. Yeah, I think that when you have an, a title like that, people are not looking at the chart anymore in the same way. They look for confirmation of that statement. And once they see the confirmation of the Q3 sales improved with 20%, they're done and they return their attention back to you, which yeah. is what you want. You know, like as a speaker, that's what you actually want. Yeah, anyway. yeah, you're right. Instead of them sitting there kind of trying to work out what your graph is saying. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, exactly. We, Kate, we always ask our guests if there was somebody in the last months, years, whatever, who made a huge impression on them with something related to presentations. Uh, who is that person so that we try and bring that person into the podcast? Do you have one name? We just need one name. I know it's hard. I know it's not easy to come up with just one name, but still. Uh, this is somewhat easy for me. My number one name is Tamsin Webster. She has actually just released a book and I think it came out like this week or last week. I've, I've ordered it. Um, she talks about messaging and I heard her talk on a podcast at some point and my, immediately, my immediate thought was, oh my gosh, this woman understands messaging to a level that I can only hope to get to. And in the last kind of four years, I have just listened to everything that she's ever recorded. Every podcast that comes out, I will listen because she understands message to such a phenomenal degree. And she has helped me understand messaging um, just on a totally different level. We had her on our podcast and she was beautiful and warm and kind of exactly what you would hope for from someone that you've admired for so many years. Got it. What is, what is the name of the book, by the way? Do you know? Find the Red Thread. Finding your Red Thread. I don't know. It's coming. It's only like literally just been released this week. Okay. Finding the Red? What is the name? Finding the Red? We'll check it out, obviously. Stay with us. Yeah. I'm like yeah, Googling it right now. Let's see. What What is this? Because that Find Your Red Thread is her the title of her book. Find Your Red Thread. Right. Red. That is it. Make your big I ideas irresistible. Know. Got it. I will find I'll find her episode uh, the episode with you at the presentation boss podcast and listen to that one. Obviously that missed something there. I don't know what happened. But I'll I will make sure that we get her on this podcast. All right, that's interesting. And one final one. Obviously uh, you host the presentation presentations boss pod presentations boss podcast is that correct presentations pod yeah that presentation is boss uh, just one presentation not presentation not, not main presentation okay presentation boss <laughs> podcast um however two part question uh what is the best place for people to reach out and connect with you and what is the best place on the web uh, i would say uh, where people can find more about what you are doing yeah, so my website is presentationboss.com.au and I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So I definitely say connect with me on LinkedIn, follow me and yeah, reach out. I'm always pretty active there and happy to connect and, and chat to people. Brilliant, brilliant. I wrote, a, wrote those down. We're going to link them up in the show notes and we're going to uh, put them also as part of the, make them uh, visible and very, very big in the context of the blog post that's coming up uh, with the podcast also. Uh, I don't know, like we can talk about that topic and the topic of presentations, I think for many, many hours, <laughs> yeah. very, very easily, uh, very, very easily. We need to repeat at some point, but on another topic so that it's not repeating the podcast episode is not repeating, but we definitely need, or probably next time we need to bring you both, you know, uh, for, uh, for an episode and see how that will sound because I don't know, like having two other colleagues who are at the same time podcasters that would be very i would be very curious to experiment with that one for sure so thank you again uh, kate for joining for this uh, for me very early uh, podcast uh, thanks for sharing all of those ideas plus that book and that episode that you also recorded um definitely going to make sure that all of that is visible to our audience and we'll link them up and again everybody 
Presentation Boss Podcast, not multiple presentations, Presentation Boss Podcast. Take a look at it if take a look at it, subscribe to it if you are involved in presentations. That's uh, that's also one that you should be definitely monitoring for and looking for. How was the rate of you publishing episodes there? Is it once per week, month, whatever? What is going on there? We did once per week for a hundred episodes, and we've taken a bit of a break. Um, right. Yeah, just for a couple of months, and yeah, we'll get back into probably once a week. Are you are you currently on that break? <laughs> or yes, currently it... on that break. So there's a hundred okay. sitting there that you can go and listen to. Um, I couldn't tell you what number Tamsin is, but yeah, there's a hundred currently sitting there. Go and listen to them. Yeah, Tom, Thomas said that you have, for in his episode, he was like, you have seven or eight hours of uh, podcast to catch to catch up on. So even oh, yeah. probably more, I would say. A hundred episodes are way more than eight hours of content, but that's another story. I think. <laughs> I think. So, Kate, again, thanks for joining. That was super nice. And hopefully we will make another episode where we have you and Thomas together and let's see how that one will go. Yeah, that'd be cool. Thanks so much for having me. It's been fun. Absolutely. Everyone, you heard it here. Probably we're already planning the next episode with both of them, both of the uh, hosts of the Presentation Boss podcast. In the meantime, check, um, connect with Kate on LinkedIn. Check their website, presentationboss.com.au very important dot com dot au all right and also check our website 356staff.com and if you still don't know about the conference that we're hosting present present wait i don't even know the conference name present to succeed.com uh, it's coming up again in 2022 so stay tuned thanks everyone for listening hope you enjoyed it subscribe if you liked it and also uh, every single time we say share it with a friend we'll appreciate it okay thanks again and see you in the next one Thank you.